Chapter 15, Discovered. In fourth grade, Zinkoff is discovered. He has been there all along, of course, in the neighborhood, in the school, for 10 years. He is already known as the kid who laughs too much and, until his operation, the kid who throws up. In fact, in order to get himself discovered, Zinkoff does not do a single thing he hasn't already done a thousand times. As with all discoveries, it is the I and not the object that changes. The discovery of Zinkoff, which will take place gradually over the course of the year, begins on the first day of school. The teacher is Mr. Yalowitz. He is the class's first man teacher. Mr. Yalowitz stands up from holding the stack of roll cards. He looks carefully at each card as if he is memorizing every name. Then he begins to shuffle the cards, rearranging their places in the stack. When he finishes, he puts the stack down. He lifts off the top card. Zinkoff, he says, his eyes never leaving the card. Donald Zinkoff, where are you? Zinkoff, knowing by now where he belongs, has already gone straight to the boondocks, last seat, far corner. He jumps to attention. Here, sir, he calls out. A smile crosses the teacher's face. He looks up. Zinkoff? Zinkoff? You want to know something, Zinkoff? Yes, sir. You're the first Z I've ever had in my class. It's not even easy being a Z, is it, Zinkoff? To tell the truth, Zinkoff has never thought much about it. I don't know, sir. Well, it's not easy. Take my word for it. I was a Y. Always the last seat in the class, always the last one in line for this or that, doomed by the alphabet. What do you think about that, Zinkoff? Zinkoff doesn't know what to think about that, and he says so. As for the rest of the class, they're thinking, so this is fourth grade. They don't know if it's being one more grade up or if it's the man teacher with his gruff man way of talking, but they're liking it and starting to feel pretty puffy about themselves. The teacher points. Zinkoff, how'd you like to experience life in the first row? Zinkoff's eyes boggle. The teacher waves grandly. Come on up here, boy. Zinkoff cries out, Yahoo! And races up front. By the time the teacher is done, Zinkoff is in seat number one, and, and Rachel Abano is in the boondocks. Joining Zinkoff in the front row are a W, a V, and two Ts. Thanks to teacher Yalowitz, the first person to discover Zinkoff is Zinkoff. Unlike his teachers in grades two and three, this one seems delighted with him. He is forever making pronouncements that give Zinkoff a new view of himself. Every morning, the first week, for example, as soon as Zinkoff enters the classroom, the teacher proclaims, and the Z shall be first. One day, as he arrives for work at 7.30 a.m., the teacher spots Zinkoff alone on the playground, coming down the sliding board. He calls out, you'll be early to your own funeral, boy. Like Zinkoff's previous teachers, Mr. Yalowitz notes his atrocious handwriting. Mr. Z, he says, whenever you put pencil to paper, unspeakable things happen. Unlike the other teachers, he says this while laughing and adds, thank God for keyboards. Mr. Yalowitz is fussy about his green board. Every Friday at precisely 2.30 in the afternoon, he washes his green board. For this purpose, he keeps a bucket and sponge in the book and supply closet. On a Friday afternoon in November, Mr. Yellowitz is called away from class. By the time he gets back, it is well past 2.30. Zinkoff is up front, standing on a chair, reaching for the highest part of the green board with the wet sponge. Mr. Yellowitz gives a chuckle. Independent little critter, aren't you? Zinkoff isn't sure if his teacher's remark is a statement or a question, nor does he quite understand what it means, but he likes the sound of it and decides it must be good, whatever it is. He looks down at the teacher and beams, yes, sir. The teacher makes himself comfortable while his student finishes the job. When Zinkoff returns to his front row seat, the class applauds. 
sometimes even whistles. By placing Zinkoff up front, by spotlighting Zinkoff with clever remarks, Mr. Yalowitz unwittingly hastens the other's discovery of him. Something else hastens that discovery too, new eyes. By the end of third grade, most of the kids' baby teeth were gone. The permanent ones had arrived in their mouths. Around fourth grade, something similar happens with eyes. The baby eyes don't drop out, nor are there eye fairies around to leave quarters under pillows, but new eyes do arrive nonetheless, big kids' eyes replacing little kids' eyes. Little kids' eyes are scoopers. They just scoop up everything they see and swallow it whole, no questions asked. Big kids' eyes are picky. They notice things that the little kids' eyes never bothered with. The way a teacher blows her nose, the way a kid dresses or pronounces a word. Thirty-seven classmates now turn their new big eyes to Zinkoff, and suddenly they see things they haven't seen before. Zinkoff has always been clumsy, but now they notice. Zinkoff has always been messy and atrocious and too early and giggly and slow and more often than not wrong with his answers. But now they notice. They notice the stars on his shirt and his atrocious hair and his atrocious way of walking and the atrocious way he volunteers for everything. They notice it all. Even the dime-sized birthmark on his neck below his right earlobe. It has been there for 10 years, but now they notice it and they stare and say, what's that? When the teacher returns graded papers, they peek over Zinkoff's shoulder and see that he never gets an A. When the music teacher comes and demonstrates instruments and passes out sheets to sign up for lessons in orchestra, they peek again and see that the silly goose signed up for all eight instruments. Those who practice with him in the school orchestra notice that he is given the thunder drum, as the teacher calls it. They notice that every time he pounds the drum, he is three beats early or three beats late, and they wince and roll their big kid eyes at each other and scowl at the teacher as if to say, do something. And she does something. She gives him a flute, the least damaging instrument. Still, he often veers off course, a wanderer among the clarinets and violins. The orchestra kids tell the rest of the kids, the rest of the kids tell the parents, and when the chorus and orchestra recital takes place that spring, nearly everyone in the audience keeps an ear peeled for the lost, solitary squeak of Zinkoff's flute. It is in the first week of June of that year that Zinkoff is most profoundly discovered. It happens during field day. 